Its condition poses a number of uh, problems because it's disintegrating. When there's a collapse, when this fibre breaks down and becomes a powdery mass, the woven matrix of the cloak, technical known, is lost and it's quite serious. As a conservator, the, the role is to kind of make the decisions about what the physical requirements are for, for these tonga. From day to day, a lot of that involves cleaning, it involves um, stabilising items that might have had damage that's occurred to them. Um, and we just want to make sure that things are, first of all, that they're well looked after and they look well looked after. We're looking at over 5,000 Tonga in two years, which obviously is a lot of objects in a very short time. I mean, the uniqueness, I guess, for me, or what makes it so special is working with material from a different culture, not Maori, obviously, um, and getting the guidance from Maori and from weavers, and I guess a more holistic approach to it. It's not just looking at the physical condition, the material, it goes way further beyond that, and that's what Teave facilitates. I have both dual roles here as a conservator, uh, but also as a weaver. And then perhaps I could say further, further to that, um, being Māori, I, th I believe it's first that conservation have actually asked the weavers their, their uh, thoughts, their considerations. Um, about the degree of conservation that should happen. This is one of very few examples where the entire cloak is woven from paru dyed mocha. Um, so in that sense it's very rare. Perhaps there were a lot of examples of that back in the day, but not many of them exist now because an inherent vice in that dyeing process is that it makes the fibres really vulnerable to degradation. To get the black, um, it's first treated with a tannin and then it's submerged into a mud, a mud that's rich in iron. Like iron does, uh, uh, when it oxidises, it, it uh, corrodes the substrate, or in this case the fibre. So many of our taonga that possess the traditionally dyed black fibre have disintegrated or deteriorate and so we can actually lose that knowledge when there's a collapse. It still has information to give um, even in its, in its deteriorated state. It still provides uh, inspiration for our weavers. Working alongside our conservators to see how we can best stabilise it but also having that input of the weavers has been really crucial as well mm. to involve them in the ongoing care of this particular mm. kākahu. We have said that we accept the loss, um, so from an ethical point of view that's what this project enabled our weavers to be able to table with conservation. One thing that came up in conversation was like don't remove this kind of fibre dust that is present on the surface. We could remove that and reveal more detail about the structure of the weaving because it is visually obscuring that structure a little bit. But the point also was that this fine coat of dust that is detached fibres from the cloak is actually part of the cloak itself and it's part of its story, it's part of its life. This is kind of coming at it from a different angle to be like, the most important thing is not for it to look clean and neat. And just because it doesn't look clean and neat doesn't mean that it's not well looked after. So it's just kind of having a little bit of a paradigm shift about what do we value and are we allowing those cultural values to be challenged and opening up our minds to different ways of doing things. I think this is quite a unique thing, the Te Awe project. There's still many things that we don't know about.
So many technical notes that we don't know about. I think we've still got a lot to learn um, and I think the beginning of many uh, things to come that will help us transfer this mātauranga, the knowledge of our tūpuna.